Welcome back to Common Ground and Inside Look at Suffolk County. I'm your host, Sheriff Steve Tompkins. Now, on this side of the show, we have an extraordinarily good friend uh, to the department, to myself, to my predecessor, Secretary Cabral, um, and that would be Stephen Crosby. And Steve is the chairman of the Gaming Commission, and he sits over that, uh, that body that is going to govern the uh, slot parlor that comes online and the three casinos that come online in the Commonwealth. And so he's here today to talk to us about what that means uh, for you, the citizen, what that means for the Commonwealth, and how this industry, which is a new, vibrant industry uh, in the Commonwealth, is built. It takes a lot to build a new industry, and uh, Steve is at the, the helm of making that happen. Steve. My pleasure. Thanks so good to see you. Me. Thanks pleasure. for coming on. So first and foremost, talk to us about what the Gaming Commission is set up to do. We have two jobs, um, well, three jobs if you want. To. First is to build an organization and a regulatory body uh, from the ground up. That means get office space, get business cards, phones, hire a staff. We started out with five commissioners and two staff, mm -hmm. and uh, within a year or so, we'll be five commissioners and 150 staff. Wow. Yeah. So the first thing is to build an organization. But that's kind of the, the, the uh, side of uh, consequence. The real obligation, first of all, is to license award the four expanded gaming licenses, three casinos and one slots parlor. One, uh, one casino in each of the three regions of, of Massachusetts, eastern, western, and southeastern, mm -hmm. and one slots parlor, which we've just now awarded to Plainville, which could have been anywhere in the Commonwealth. So we're doing the evaluation process, coming up with the criteria, assessing all the applications, making sure that the background checks are clean, that you don't have any bad people involved in these deals, and then eventually deciding who gets the license. In the case of Eastern Mass and Suffolk County, the debate will be between the project in Revere, the Mohegan Sun Suffolk Downs project, and the WIN proposal that's in Everett. And we'll be making that decision in the next few months. So that's job one, license these facilities. Pick who's going to get the license. And then job two is to regulate them for the future. And we will just become a regulatory body, making sure that they play by the rules, that they address problem gambling appropriately, that they manage the cash flow in this cash business carefully, that their surveillance is right, that they keep out bad people and so on and so forth. So that's so it's licensed and then regulated. So now when you talk about the <coughs> regulatory aspect of it, is this set down by the legislators or is it the gaming commission that comes up with the criteria that these organizations will have to adhere to? Both. Uh, this bill, this legislation that was passed back in November of 2011 was a very, very good piece of legislation. Mm -hmm. The legislators, particularly Stan Rosenberg from Western good Mass, man, Senator Stan man. Rosenberg, yeah. good guy, mm -hmm. did a tremendous amount of work and really learned the best practices in the industry and gave us the tools to do this job pretty well. So there's a fair amount of detail about what we have to look at in terms of internal controls, but that's only a structure. So we've gone out and assessed the industry and decided how we fill things in. But it's a combination of taking a pretty good law, a very good law, and then filling out the details. Because it's a long way, as you know, from a law right. to a complete regulatory environment right. that right. implements that law. Okay, so now talk to me about that, that the slots license. How was that awarded? Were there a number of contenders for yep. that? And, and how did you decide of those contenders who would get it? I think we started out with this five or six or maybe even seven people that okay. were looking for a city. In Massachusetts, you have to, if you're a, a licensed applicant, you have to find a community that will support you, a host community. Oh. And if, if a community doesn't want you, you're out. Okay. <laughs> so uh, several got kicked out. But in the end, we had three applications. We had a company in Lemonster, a company in Plainville, and a company in Rainham. Mm -hmm. They all three submitted uh, background app information to us. We did exhaustive background checks. We discovered a problem down in Plainville. You probably heard about their CEO had been taking money out of the money room, pop, putting it in his no, pocket. Sorry, his, or, his, his owners didn't even know about it. They kicked him out, brought in a new group, Penn National. Mm -hmm. um, so we did exhaustive background checks. Then after they passed the background checks, they gave us their applications. 15,000 pages of, of information for the for the applications. 15,000 for one application? For each, all, all, all three, three together. Okay. But for the casinos, it's 15,000 for each. Yeah, it's a big project. Okay. So we put together, an, uh, you know, the, the categories of evaluation are finance, site and building design, mitigation, economic development, and a sort of general overview factor that we call the wow factor. So what are you going to do special? Gotcha. 
uh, and each commissioner heads up one of those evaluation teams. They've got, we've got consultants and advisors and investment bankers and what have you, and we pour through all that information. And then last week, we had four days of public meetings where we put all that information on the table in public and then debated who should win in public and eventually had a vote and uh, plain bill won three to two. So correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of these, this process that you just mentioned, uh, a lot of this, if, I'm under, if I understood this correctly, in other states has, has actually gone on in private. Yeah. Um, why is it that the Commonwealth is doing it in public? I mean, there are obvious reasons, but I'd like right. you to uh, articulate that. Well, it's very different in Massachusetts. In Ohio, for example, uh, the, there was a constitutional amendment passed authorizing expanded gaming, and in the constitutional amendment, it said where the, the licensees would be. The communities mm. where they would be. It was layered down. Without the community the, being involved? Yeah, totally. really? The community is out of it. Right. It was a, a constitutional amendment. Wow. Right. Here, it was a highly competitive process with all this local control and, and uh, options for host and surrounding communities to exercise real, real influence. Um, so we took the direction that the legislature gave us and um, just added on it, and made it very transparent, very open. And it's a good way to make decisions. You know, it's not the easiest thing to do to sit there in public. I mean, it's a lot more fun <laughs> if you can sit in the back room and you can, you know, use right. colloquial language. And but, right. uh, but here we sat there. We heard that the Penn National stock price was going up and down as we were talking about who was going to win, because hedge fund managers were watching our webs, our webcast, right. looking whether it was looking good for Penn National or not. I mean, it's an incredibly transparent process, okay. and that's the way it should be. And so when you talk about sitting in front of the communities, host community or others, the community residents, do they really, really roll up their sleeves and get intimately involved in this? Or is this something where they're like, okay, whatever, it's going to happen? No, this, so is not, this is not one of those okay, whatever projects. Okay. As you know, you know this, is a, this is a very controversial uh, area. Um, it's been kicked around in Massachusetts for 20 plus years mm -hmm, and it's mm -hmm. been pro and con and pro and con. Um, no, this was very much uh, roll up your sleeves, pro or con, both sides. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We had many losing votes. Milford voted against it. Palmer voted against it. Mm -hmm. East Boston voted against it. West Springfield, Longmeadow, many Holyoke, many communities voted. Foxboro, uh, many communi communities voted against it. On the other hand, you had Rainham, Plainville, Lemonster, Revere, mm -hmm. Springfield, um, others that voted in favor. Um, and it was very much a grassroots effort on both sides. The folks really got involved. Now, of the three casino licenses, has any of those in the three places that you mentioned throughout the Commonwealth, has any of those been awarded yet? No. Uh, Eastern Mass will award probably the end of, Jan uh, end of June. Mm -hmm. uh, Western Mass will award the end of May. Mm -hmm. And Southeastern Mass is a little more complicated because of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe. Right. They right. have right. federal rights to have a casino there if they can get federal land, uh, basically a reservation designation, then they have the right to do a casino there without any control from the state and, or, at all if they want. So that region, we are going to go ahead and, and put out uh, commercial bids, mm -hmm. but when we make the decision on the commercial bids, we'll have to decide how likely is it that the Indian tribe will also get a license, in which case, um, I'm not sure, we don't want two in southeastern Mass. So I that's know. running about six months behind. So now, when the decision is made to award the license, is it just the Gaming Commission, or mm -hmm. is it the Gaming Commission in tandem with legislators? No, it's totally the Gaming Commission. It's just so, so the legislators yeah. have done their work, They've they're done. done it, and uh, you know, one of the critical pieces <coughs> that's good, the legislature gave us total independence. We mm -hmm. don't rely on our budget. We get our budget. We're, on, we're, we're funded by a loan from the Rainy Day Fund right now. We'll pay all that back from license fees from the nice. operators. And then all of our expenses will be assessed onto the operators. There's not a dollar of tax money. We don't have to go to the legislature to get our money, which, as you know, makes life simpler. <laughs> oh, Lord. Please, yes. <laughs> right. and, Trust uh, me, folks. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, right. 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 Enough okay. said. Right. Um, so we're tremendous. I have a seven-year term. You know, I'll be, oh, that's I'll be in office if I cared to be in office. I'll be dead before that probably. But if I cared to stay for seven <laughs> years, I'd be in office longer than the governor who appointed me, you know, and, and the next governor. I'll be right. the, you know. So we have tremendous independence. It's totally up to us. So what does this mean fiscally for the Commonwealth? What type of revenue can we expect to come down? The numbers are... Uh, there's a range, but it seems like a pretty reasonable estimate once we get all four licenses awarded. 
would be something like four to five hundred million dollars a year in uh, in wow. additional tax revenue. Now okay. that's, I think I think our total tax take in the Commonwealth is something like twenty two billion, something <laughs> like that. So, <laughs> adding another half billion is real money. It's not totally transformative, but that's real money. So that it goes to the Commonwealth now. Say in uh, did you say Plainville, Plain? Yeah. Okay, in Plainville, will the uh, the uh, the entity uh, Penn National? Do they give that host community uh, yeah. a set of money, and how does that work? Well, they had to negotiate a host community agreement, and the host community has the ability to say no. They okay. have to negotiate a host community agreement. That means they have to make a deal with the governing structure, okay. the mayor or whoever. And then there has to be a referendum in the community to approve it. Mm -hmm. And if the referendum doesn't pass, they're out. So... Um, the community, the host community, has a lot of leverage, <laughs> okay. and they uh, they dip, have done a lot of negotiation. In the case of Boston, I think the money that they were going to get if the casino had gone to East Boston, I think it was like thirty three million dollars okay. above and beyond paying for all the consequences. Now like that would be building. a one time thirty three. No, no, every or year. Every year. Yeah. Right. Right. Wow. I, in addition to the bidder, the applicant would pay for road improvements mm -hmm. and all the other things kind of offsetting any negative consequences, mm -hmm. then there's a big chunk of cash on top. So, yeah, they're, they're pretty lucrative deals for the host community. Okay, so with that amount of money that can come into what well, will come into the Commonwealth, when you talk about negative consequences, what type of money is being set aside for gambling addictions and those This things? is a really good question. Um, in all of the United States in 2012, there was a total of $58 million set aside for jurisdictions to deal with problem gambling. $58 million for all of the United States. We will have between 15 to $20 million mm -hmm. just for Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So we'll have... Annually. Annually, mm -hmm. right. So the legislature has given us the tools nice. to figure out how to keep problem gambling to a barest possible minimum. Nobody knows what the barest possible minimum is, but we've got a huge research project out right now where we're getting a baseline study of the gambling uh, habits of everybody in Massachusetts. It's a 10,000 sample survey, a wow. huge survey. Okay. So we'll know what they are today. Okay. We'll know what happens when you layer in expanded gambling, casino gambling. We'll know what happens when we do intervention strategies to try to fix problems. So we've got the resources to um, try to address this serious problem. Uh, serious side effect of casino gambling uh, with all the tools at our command and to keep it to the lowest possible. Now, does the Gaming Commission have governance over the oversight of that to make sure that um, that money is being spent wisely with responsible entities? Yeah, actually, that's another good question. It's, it's, it's being uh, administered in conjunction with the Secretary of Health and Human Services uh -huh. in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So the way we're setting it up is the Secretary and I or our designees will chair the group that will allocate those funds. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, the, and then there'll be an advisory group that's made up of people from the Compulsive Gambling Association of Massachusetts and uh, the Department of Public Health and so on and so forth. So the answer is yes, this will be, and there's gonna be all this research being done on how well we do too. So. Uh, it will be well spent, no question about it. So now, what do you say to folks that say, okay, we've looked at, uh, you know, MGM, Penn National, Caesars, Wynn, so on and so forth, and if you look across um, the spectrum with these entities making or losing money, what do you say to folks that say, well, these organizations haven't turned a profit or they're in the hole? Does that get factored into your discussion? Which when ones you, are you talking about now? Any, any of them, any, any, I'm just oh. off the top. Say, yeah. Just say, yeah. I don't want to say... Penn National, yeah. but any entity that applies, yeah. if they are fiscally in the hole, yeah. are, is that, that I'm, I'm assuming, is taken into consideration? Oh, absolutely. That part of your background check is that you have to have the fiscal, fiscal capacity to do this. Right, right, and right. then uh, part of the application itself is the real details. Do we, f do we really uh, believe your numbers? Do you have enough cash in the bank to handle the downturn? You know, can, you, can we discount your promises? And uh, if things go badly, can you weather the storm? What's your track record? What's your debt to equity ratio? Mm -hmm, so yeah, mm -hmm. we've done a lot of uh, background Two checks into that. the financial situ situation. Yeah. Now, do you actually you have a, the gaming commission? I know you said you have a certain individuals, but do you also have a board that sits in governance over the gaming commission or no? no. We are the governors. You there, are the governors. There's an okay. advisory board. There's something called the Gaming Policy Advisory Committee. Okay. And Sheriff, who's made, Sheriff who's Cabral makes, has a representative on that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, 
but those are appointments. Some are made by the governor, some come from the legislature, but that's only an advisory board. Mm -hmm, you know, that mm -hmm. we are the, we are the, the top uh, uh, governance force here. So how did you come to be the uh, the chair ask, of this? Ask Governor Patrick. <laughs> I have no idea. You know where I was before this. That's right, you must. I right. was happily the dean of the McCormick Graduate School of Policy and Global Studies, and our finest graduate is well, Sheriff Well, I don't Steve know Tompkins. about that, but you know what? I got to tell you, just as a quick plug for the McCormick School uh, at UMass Boston, and it's an extraordinary program that I really was fortunate to get into and graduate from. And Mr. Crosby at the time was the dean of that program. But if you're interested in policy, if you're interested in public affairs, if you're interested in just civics, it's a great program uh, to look at. And I couldn't, I couldn't speak highly enough. There aren't enough superlatives to talk about just how great that program is. Yep. That said, um, you said you're going to be commissioner for seven years now. What are you, three I'm, years in? I'm two a years in? Over two years in, yeah. How's it been? Uh, talk, talk to me about, for you personally, riding, uh, you know, herd on this, which is a huge yeah. endeavor. Talk to me about that. Well, I mean, I've, you know, I've been a, I've been a CEO before. I've been a CEO most of my life. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been in charge of, you know, big operations. This is actually a small operation compared to a lot of the things that I've done before in terms of the, the financial size and so right. forth. It's big in terms of the organizational challenge and pu putting it all together. But I'm actually not the chief executive officer. We have an executive director. I'm the chair of the board. Uh -huh. So I don't run the place on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, my job is to facilitate the policy-making decisions and the regulatory decisions that the commission makes. Um, so it's a kind of a different role. It's not a CEO type role. The thing that's different here, of course, is the public scrutiny. I mean, we are totally under the public sure. eye, and you know, you go through this, and, yeah. and you know, if the press gets in its mind to whack you about something, and it really doesn't matter whether you deserve to be whacked or not, you're gonna right. get whacked. Right. And you know, that's not fun. Um, and every little tiny thing we do is under incredible scrutiny. And, you know, since I'm largely the spokesperson for the for the organization, you know, I'm every, every time I open my mouth, somebody's got a camera on, and it, I can say something wrong by accident. Mm -hmm. So the scrutiny is is tough. And I've I've been sued as an individual by uh, one of the unhappy losers in the earlier stage of the process, uh, and that's no fun. Right. Um, but having said that, it's been an extraordinary experience. I mean, it's it's a it's a bizarre, interesting industry with larger-than-life characters. Mm -hmm. uh, it can do good and it can do ill, you know. And we're not we're not advocates of gambling per se. I'm not an advocate of casino gambling. I was opposed to it when I was Secretary of Administration and Finance. Right. What we're in favor of is implementing this law well. It's been decided we're going to have casino gambling in Massachusetts unless right. it gets repealed, in which case we'll go do something else. Right now it's been decided we're going to have it. We want to have it in a way that maximizes the benefits and minimizes the negative consequences. Mm -hmm. That's our job. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's an incredible challenge. It's, a, it's certainly a case study in public policy making exactly. from the get-go. Yeah. But so one of the things that I want to touch on, though, is taking basically nothing and making something out of it. We often talk to kids and youth, we often talk to those that are transitioning out of an incarcerated state, what we call reentry, going back to, into community, and we talk about the, 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 the warmth, the, 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 the ability to take something and grow it, to build it, to grow it. My question to you is, you've got something that where there was nothing, and you guys are cre you guys and ladies are creating something. How does that feel to be a part of a pro that process to really take something that's going to probably be here till the end Forever. of time, yeah, right. you know, and say I was at the forefront of that and I was instrumental in creating an entity that's going to have some legs and longevity. Yeah, well, it's great. I mean, it's it's a it's a rare opportunity. I was the founding dean of the McCormick Graduate School, yeah. so that was something very similar. I was the first dean of that graduate school. I've actually been an entrepreneur in most of my business life. I've never worked in a big company. It's always been my own entrepreneurial companies. Mm -hmm. So I think that's part of the reason why the governor asked me to do this, because I've had a lot of experience in this kind of startup mode. Um, but there is a legacy there, you know, and if we do this, many, many jurisdictions, many states get this wrong. If people end up in the slammer, or people end up with grand jury mm -hmm. investigations, mm -hmm. people end up having to relicense, people end up with uh, promises being kept made that aren't kept. Um, if we do this well, then we will really offer something to Massachusetts in terms of jobs and revenue and economic development. We'll keep the, the negative consequences to a minimum. 
and to have an opportunity to be seminal in that process is pretty unique. It doesn't come along, you know, right. especially at my advanced age. Right. So. Oh, please, whatever, you've been at 34, 35? <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> so, you got it. So on one side, we have Connecticut. On the other side, <clears throat> we have Rhode Island. And we had Massachusetts. We had the Commonwealth, and our folks would go in either direction or other places to spend right. their gambling dollars. Was part of the thought process, uh, do you know? Very much so. That let's keep that money right. in Absolutely. the Commonwealth? There is something like $750 million a year that's lost to Connecticut and Rhode Island, mm -hmm. and another $250 million or something like that that probably goes to Las Vegas mm -hmm. and Maine Jersey. and so forth, right. yeah. uh, Atlantic City. Um, so that's a billion dollars a year of potential revenue, of which our, the Commonwealth share would be $250 million. So in tax revenue, $250 million in tax revenue is going to somebody else that could be coming here. So the legislature made a big priority out of repatriating Massachusetts dollars that are going someplace else. Right. So if we did nothing but repatriate, we didn't get another dollar, we'd still be generating something like $250 million a year in tax revenue, mm -hmm. which is non-trivial. Um, if we can bring people in from other states uh, and out of the country into our bigger facilities, then we're, those are real high impact dollars because we're not taking we're not taking them from other from Massachusetts citizens. We don't want to just take a dollar out of your pocket and put it into the casino operator's pocket right. that you would otherwise have spent next door. We, best money is money you bring in from out of state or out of country. I see. So, um, but priority one is repatriating lost dollars. And you know, it's interesting you just bring that out of out of uh, the state or out of the country. Does the uh, Gaming Commission or this entity also work with the tourism folks, or, or is that down the road, uh, you know, it's, once these things are up and going? Yeah, it's, it's not really we who will work with uh, Mass Office of Travel and Tourism and Massport and so forth. It's the, it's the, uh, the gaming operators. And we have put that uh, out as one of our criteria. How are you going to promote uh, tourism in Massachusetts as a whole or in uh -huh. your region? So as we're now reviewing their applications, we want to see that they've reached out to Massport, that they understand how Massport is lobbying to get direct flights from China, for example, and will work with Massport to get direct flights from China, which will enhance a lot of things in Massachusetts, including our revenue take on the, on the casino gambling side. Right. You know, our, in the case we, in our Lemonster proposal, they were working very closely with the Johnny Appleseed Trail, the, the, mm -hmm. the uh, Tourist Association mm -hmm. in the north central Massachusetts region. So that's a, an evaluation criteria that we have laid out. They're implementing that, that criteria. So it sounds like this could be a boon for hospitality, other industries in the Commonwealth. But when you talk about that international trade, this could actually have a spillover to work and, and, and have a fiscal advantage in areas that may not have even been thought about or considered when you talked about having gaming uh, here in the, in the Commonwealth. Would that be a correct statement? Well, there could be a lot of different. I mean, first of all, you know, to build... To build one of the casinos is going to cost somewhere between 800 million and a billion and a half dollars. Okay. That's a lot of money coming in. Um, the money that flows through, the jobs that gets generated, uh, all the product, goods, and services that get bought. So there's a lot of ripple effects. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the sine qua non, as you said, is bringing in money from out, bringing in the high rollers from other states or other countries, and having them spend big money here. Uh, means that we generate more jobs, we generate more tax revenue, we generate more goods and services being purchased locally. You know, those are the high impact dollars. You know what's interesting? The governor appointed me to this feasibility commission looking at whether or not we should, Boston should bring the 2024 Olympics oh, really? uh, to Boston. That. Yeah, and it was fun. It was, it was, it was, it was <laughs> a great uh, uh, project to serve on. I say that as a backdrop to say that when you talk about infrastructure and other things that the Commonwealth really needs and really can use, if you talk about this additional revenue that's coming in, and uh, when legislators are debating where the money is going to go for this, that, or the other thing, it seems like this will be cash flow, fiscal uh, prosperity that has not been here that could actually go and address some of these other things like bridges and roads and yeah. and, and, and the like, school buildings yeah, and so absolutely. on and so forth. Was that factored into the discussion yeah. also? Well, in fact, there is a, I think mm -hmm. there are 10 different categories where the money goes. If we get $500 million uh -huh. from the, uh, or even $300 million a year from the gaming tax revenues, it's already dedicated. So there's oh, some goes okay. to local aid, okay. some goes to the transportation infrastructure okay. fund, some goes to support the racehorse industry, okay. some goes to support uh, higher ed. 
Um, there is, a, I think, it's, maybe it's more than 10, a 10 or 20 okay. uh, different funds get supported by a share of this revenue. So absolutely, it was, it was anticipated. This is pretty well thought out. And so this yeah, is... that's why I say it was a great law. And this is a year-over-year -year, um, initiative so that um, this is always going to happen. Yeah, this isn't one-time revenue. There's, there is one-time revenue because each of the license holders has to put up a big check. In the mm -hmm. case of the slots license, $25 million. And the casino license is 85 million each. Mm -hmm. That's one-time money that gets allocated too. But the every the 500 million a year that I'm talking about, or the 400 million nice. a year that I'm talking about, that's year-over-year -year money. That is extraordinary. I mean, that's incredible. I don't know if there's any for the sheriff of Suffolk County. But you know, well, listen. There sure <laughs> should be. <laughs> I like, I like Stevie. I like him so much. You know, I'll tell you what, Steve, and, and you, you know me. We go way back, and we mentioned this before I came on air. One of the things that I really like about being sheriff, and uh, our prior guest, uh, the new superintendent, uh, William Gross, is that corrections really is being factored into that whole discussion about public safety mm -hmm. and civic responsibility. And so when you talk about casinos coming online, the good and the bad of that, to be in that discussion, to be at the table, yeah. to talk about the governance of the Commonwealth is, is, is really extraordinary. And, you know, one of the things, being, going back to the, my experience at McCormick and what you guys and ladies put together there is just civic responsibility, you yeah. know, and that's one yeah. thing that we talk to kids and citizens about a lot is being civically engaged and civ civically active. And it sounds like through this process, one that has been so transparent that throughout the Commonwealth, folks really did belly up to the bar to be engaged. Well, that's true. That's absolutely true. But also, you know, part of our job, the legislature says we want to use these jobs to target underemployed, hard to employ, and unemployed people. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, communities of color are going to be low income, high uh -huh. unemployment rates. And we have a director of diverse uh, workforce and supplier development mm -hmm. um, trying to make sure that the same kind of community that you're working with right. and the superintendent is working with is has an opportunity to get in the game here and we've we've created a program with the community colleges to do job development oh, wow. training so that you can learn to be a you know a poker player or nice. you can learn to be a really good uh, house uh, keeping person I mean yeah. it's it's you need to get trained you need to know how to do this you need to know how to dress you need to know how to report to That's work right. um, so we're we're putting as much training in the pipeline as we can so we can target these new jobs. It should be something like 10,000 new permanent jobs across right. the Commonwealth That's great. Um, at, at hard to employ uh, segments of the population. So listen, we are out of time. First and foremost, uh, if folks want more information about what the Gaming Commission is yeah. doing, where can they get that information? Massgaming.com. You know, there's a ton there. There's a ton of stuff there. There's an MGC comments, a place to talk to us. We get thousands by now, thousands of comments from the public apropos of your civic involvement, mm -hmm. um, and job opportunities are listed there, the whole bit, Mass, Beautiful. massgaming.com. Beautiful. And my, my, my final thing to you is, as a longtime friend, I applaud you. Thank I you. applaud what you guys are, are, are doing over there, and we really wish you Godspeed. Thank you very much, much Sheriff. All right. Thanks for coming Steve. on. Really Thank appreciate you. it. All right. All right, folks, that's it. Uh, we're out of time. We're out of here for another week. We'll be back again next week. Until then, you take care of yourself. We'll see you soon. Peace.